Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and remember that we have Academy-themed gear at the Academy Store. And links to our Patreon account are in the description. We appreciate you. The Academy is dedicated to introducing you to the concepts necessary to understand spaceflight. These thought experiments are necessary to keep us from getting boxed in. We were all looking forward to the launch of the transorbital starship. That's right, I said transorbital. Just like we like to say day loon and dark loon for the two week long lunar sunlit and dark periods, or at least I do, we prefer to say transorbital over suborbital. We firmly believe that if there is not a good word for something, consider a new term. Why isn't the scheduled March Starship launch suborbital? To our way of thinking, the term suborbital should be used to describe flights into space that don't truly reach orbital altitude or orbital velocity. The best example of these are the Blue Origin New Shepard. Blue Origin is very secretive so we'll have to use secondary sources for some of these numbers. The New Shepard uses the BE-3 engine. The BE-3, being a hydrogen-powered, pump-fed, combustion tap-off cycle engine, should have a specific impulse of at least 375 seconds at sea level. It would be much higher in vacuum. With a total mass of 75 metric tons, according to astronautics, and a dry mass of 20.57 tons. This gives us a delta V of only 4.76 kilometers per second, half of what it would need to get into orbit. That's because this is a single stage ship. It releases a capsule that barely goes above the Kármán line, which is recognized internationally to be 100 kilometers. The Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 and 3 are another example. These don't even reach an altitude of 100 kilometers, though they do cross what the United States considers the edge of space, 50 miles or 80 kilometers. Neither of these spacecrafts are capable of reaching the altitude necessary for a stable low Earth orbit, which is considered to be 200 kilometers, or the necessary orbital velocity of at least 7.8 kilometers per second. The SpaceX Starship is a different matter. It will be launching from Boca Chica, Texas in a ballistic trajectory. It will exceed orbital altitude by a long ways. We don't have all the specifics on its flight. But let's look at an example of a ballistic missile that we do have all the stats on. The Atlas F ICBM was the last Atlas rocket type to go into a silo with a warhead. This was a kerosene and liquid oxygen powered rocket. It stood 24 meters tall with a diameter of 3 meters, and it had a gross mass of 122 metric tons. It could produce 1,713 kilonewtons of thrust and deliver 830 kilograms to a 185 kilometer orbit, producing a delta V of at least 9.2 kilometers per second. Interestingly, two of its engines would fall away at a certain point in its flight. To reduce structural mass once it had reached a certain velocity and had burned enough propellant that it no longer needed so much thrust. This rocket could carry a W-38 warhead 12,570 kilometers, reaching an apogee of 800 kilometers, with only enough propellant to produce a delta V of 5.68 kilometers per second. Why the discrepancy? It takes a lot less delta V to fly a ballistic arc than it does to go into orbit. We have calculated the delta V of a SpaceX Starship before, but quickly. Without a payload, we get a total mass of around 4,900 metric tons. On booster burnout, we would have gone through about 3,350 tons of propellant if we keep 50 tons to come back and land. This would give us a delta V of 3.73 kilometers per second. Now the empty booster separates and we fire the Starship. If we were to burn all the propellant, except for 30 tons, we would have an additional delta V of 8.10 kilometers per second, giving us a total of 11.83 kilometers per second. SpaceX could almost send an empty starship straight to the moon. The transorbital starship 
will be traveling about 30,000 kilometers. The Earth will be rotating under it during its flight, and while the delta V required will be less than that needed to go into orbit, there is no doubt the Starship can generate enough delta V to do so. And coming down from an apogee of probably around 1,500 kilometers, it will hit the Earth's atmosphere with a velocity of about 8.5 kilometers per second. Both of these exceed orbital parameters. So we would argue that to call the upcoming Starship flight suborbital is misleading, and that we should use the term transorbital to describe a mission like this. Let us know what you think. Thanks for listening, and stay safe at Astro Proterra.